Greetings, everyone. Greetings on behalf of the Association for Baha'i Studies North America. It's my pleasure to extend to you a very warm welcome to this next session of the 2020 virtual conference. We hope you've been enjoying the wide range of offerings so far. Of course, there's more to come. And beyond enjoying, hopefully these sessions are giving rise to some ideas you might have about things you would like to do to maybe engage in various ABS lines of action or related types of efforts, um, whether that means initiating conversations or some study or some small collaborative initiatives of some kind. If you want to know more about the direction of ABS and how to get involved, uh, please join the session on Wednesday evening, which there will be presentations and Q&A on that. So I'd now like to introduce you to our presenter for, for today, Dr. Michael Sabet, speaking to us from Canada. Dr. Sabet is a PhD student in political science at the University of Toronto, where he researches how participation in non-adversarial democratic processes impacts individuals. He is a lawyer by training, having practiced constitutional litigation in Ottawa after clerking at the Supreme Court. He is also the incoming editor of the Association's Journal of Baha'i Studies. As you may know, John Hatcher has served so ably as editor for several years, doing a fabulous job, and has decided to retire from that role. And we are delighted that Michael is taking up that work. The title of Michael's presentation is The Utmost Loving Kindness, Discerning a Framework for the Treatment of Animals in the Baha'i Writings. As he writes, the question of the proper relationship between humans and animals can easily fall into, quote, the all too common tendencies to delineate sharp dichotomies and engage in intractable debate that obstructs the search for viable solutions, quoting from a House of Justice letter. The Baha'i writings transcend the dichotomy between domination themed narratives that assign purely instrumental value to the natural world and materialistic narratives that deny any unique status for the human. This presentation will explore certain relational principles in the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha that can guide our contributions to discourses dealing with animals and the natural world. After the presentation, there will be time for questions. On your app, please scroll down to the bottom and press add comment anytime you wish during the presentation. So welcome, Michael. Thank you, Martha. And uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, in attendance, who's taken the time uh, to be here. So my name is Michael Sabat, uh, and I'll just share my screen here. Okay, so I hope everyone can now see the presentation. Uh, as mentioned, the presentation is called The Utmost Loving Kindness. And uh, what I'm hoping to do today is to present the basic outline of a framework for the treatment of animals that, as I understand it, emerges from the Baha'i writings. Um, you know, a, a full treatment of the topic of the nature of animals as it appears in the writings and all of the ethical implications that follow would take a lot more time uh, than we have today. So my approach is going to be uh, to just take a few steps to illuminate this question. I'll start by sketching out very briefly uh, a couple of influential positions in the broader discourse in society about animals and about nature. And I'm gonna highlight aspects of these positions that I think reflect what the Universal House of Justice in its 29th of November, 2017 letter on climate change calls the all too common tendencies to delineate sharp dichotomies and engage in intractable debate that obstructs the search for viable solutions. After that, rather than try to do a broad sweep of everything that the Baha'i writings have to say about animals, I'm going to focus on a few quotations that speak to the place we are at in the broader discourse about animals. Uh, and I'll also be focusing on a few points in the writings that in my experience receive a bit less attention amongst Baha'is on the subject. Uh, so I won't be spending much time on the fairly self-explanatory statements from Abdul Baha about the human diet. The core of the presentation is exegetical. It's sort of an exploration of the, the meaning and implication uh, of the writings. Uh, but then at the end, I will discuss some practical implications for our individual and collective lives. In the spirit of Baha'u'llah's reminder, is not the object of every revelation to effect transformation in the whole character of mankind. A transformation that shall manifest itself both outwardly and inwardly, that shall affect both its inner life and external conditions. 
And then at the end, uh, we'll have time for questions. So overall, uh, I hope to show that the Baha'i writings on this issue are not only a useful guide to us in our efforts to improve our characters and behave ever more morally and with greater justice in the world, but that they can also help us make a unique contribution to the discourse about animals and the environment more generally, which of course is a, a very important discourse in the world today. Now, the usual caveat uh, applies here that applies whenever anyone is expressing their understanding of the Baha'i writings. Everything apart from the text of the quotes themselves is going to represent my own understanding. So it may be wrong, it may be incomplete, it may be imbalanced. Like anyone, I'm going to be bringing my own biases to the study of the writings. What I hope is that um, what I have to say is at least interesting enough that you'll think about it, uh, even if only to ultimately disagree. All right, so let's begin then by looking at uh, two important and contrasting views from Western philosophy that speak to the nature of animals and the question of what we owe to, to animals. Each of these views derives ethical consequences from a particular ontological view of animals. So in other words, what we think an animal is fundamentally, its nature or its essence, uh, will determine what duties, if any, we owe to the animal. Uh, the two views that I'm going to present can't cover the field of philosophical positions on the topic, of course, but I do hope they'll help us see uh, why discussions about animals can easily fall into intractable argument, as the earlier quote suggested. So the first view that I'll present, uh, we could call it an Enlightenment rationalist view about the nature of animals. Like a lot of Enlightenment thinking, uh, while it adopts a rationalist methodology, it owes something of its content to earlier Christian thought. One of the most influential views of animals uh, came from René Descartes. Uh, so this is Descartes here. Descartes was a dualist. So he believed that everything in creation was material, except for the human mind, which is non-physical in his view, and is the seat of consciousness. Uh, so you can see the connection to uh, religious thinking here. Descartes is in a sense trying to provide a rational explanation for the tangible part of the human reality, which in religious language is called the soul. Now the human body, uh, including the brain, uh, to Descartes is simply matter, like rocks or plants. And animals, which lack a non-physical mind in his view, are nothing more than automata. So an animal is capable of reacting reflexively to stimuli, but it's not capable of either thought or suffering. The cries of an animal in apparent pain uh, were to Descartes simply the screeches of a malfunctioning machine. So this view denied that there are any moral limits on how a human might treat an animal. This Enlightenment view reached a greater level of sophistication with Immanuel Kant. Kant is probably the philosopher who first comes to mind when we think about ends and means. Uh, we may also associate him with the idea of the categorical imperative. Uh, this is essentially um, Kant believed that our behavior should be governed by universal rules that are discoverable by reason, rules that you can apply in any situation. So one formulation of Kant's categorical imperative is that you must never act in a way that treats a human, whether yourself or someone else, as a mere means to an end. A human is always an end unto themselves. So let's see how this works out in practice. Suppose a random human being, we'll take uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins for no reason in particular, is hungry. Uh, the question arises, can he ethically kill and eat an animal? How about a human? Well, uh, eating the animal is fine, according to Kant, but no matter how much he wants to, Sir Anthony should not eat a human because that would be treating the other human as a mere, ends, uh, a mere means to satisfy his own ends. Now, animals for Kant are essentially things because they lack reason. So they certainly can be mere means to our ends. That's permissible. He does, however, say there is one reason to be kind to animals. It's a purely instrumental reason, and it's instrumental to our duties to other humans. As Kant says, he who is cruel to animals becomes also in his dealings with men. And we'll come back to that idea later when we look at the Baha'i writings. Okay, so that's one view of animals, the view that the animal is a mere means to human ends and is not owed any moral duties, either because it lacks an immortal soul or because it lacks reason in the enlightenment view. 
A different view emerges from the ethics of utilitarianism. One of the most influential applications of utilitarianism to the question of how we treat animals comes from the Australian philosopher, Peter Singer. Uh, so a quick review of utilitarianism. In contrast to Kant's categorical imperative, in a utilitarian framework, it's the consequences of any given action that determine whether it is ethical or not. Uh, crudely speaking, utilitarianism holds that the net amount of pain and pleasure created by an action have to be weighed. If pleasure outweighs pain, the action is good. Uh, different strands of utilitarianism have variations on this formula, but as a, a general rule, uh, that, that will serve our purposes. So Singer essentially argues that there's no basis for discriminating between species when it comes to weighing their pain and pleasure. Such discrimination would be, in his words, speciesism. So an animal's interests in avoiding pain and suffering have to be weighed in our decisions about how to treat them. This view imposes definite limits on how we are permitted to treat animals. In many circumstances, I can't ethically kill and eat an animal in this view because the animal's pain will outweigh any benefit I might derive from eating it. Singer uses this argument mostly against factory farming, which he argues, and not without reason, imposes a life of suffering on the animal quite apart from its ultimate death. Uh, it should be noted that there is a distinct position, which we can call an animal rights argument, which says that all or at least some animals should have absolute rights that cannot be violated, like a human being. Uh, in that case, utilitarian calculus wouldn't enter into the matter. I'm not gonna get into the animal rights position because in practice, the consequences of the two views will often overlap. Now, it should also be noted that uh, some utilitarian thinkers do distinguish more clearly between animals and humans. Uh, John Stuart Mill, for instance, wrote that it is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. In other words, for Mill, there was something about the human being that makes his or her pain and pleasure of a different order than that of an animal. But for Singer, this distinction is fundamentally untenable. And arguing from a materialist ontological framework as shown in this table, Singer basically says that all the distinctions we draw between the human and other animals are arbitrary. And without a spiritual perspective, this isn't an unreasonable hypothesis. When we look at complex animals like great apes, for instance, they do seem to have some version, however rudimentary, of most of the faculties that humans display. Um, and as an aside, it's my view, um, this isn't from a systematic review of utilitarianism, but uh, as I see it, utilitarianism is usually going to trend towards a materialist outlook, if only because material or physical pain and pleasure though they can be hard to quantify, are much easier to quantify than spiritual good. So a material framework just becomes sort of a default in utilitarianism. So it should be said that uh, the two positions that I've outlined might look a little bit like caricatures. After all, most people are not utilitarians in practice. And on the other hand, very few people I think would say that we owe absolutely no duty to be kind to any animal. But these two views, uh, caricatures though they may be, do end up being influential because I think they feed into our human tendency, uh, or maybe it's just our society's tendency, to think in dichotomies. So, for instance, if I'm a person who believes that humans are truly unique in creation, whether due to reason or soul, I may be inclined to believe in a soft version of Kant's ideas about animals. I might think, yeah, we should be nice to animals, I guess, but what does it really matter? They don't have a soul or they can't think like us, so it's not a big deal what happens to them. Now for the other group, which is the group that thinks that humans aren't particularly special, they will often come to this conclusion based on a conscious or unconscious materialistic view of reality. And this I think comes with its own pitfalls. Okay, so this group might find a kind of utilitarianism attractive because it seems fair. Uh, or as Baha'is might say, uh, it actually appeals to their innate spiritual faculty of justice, which is a faculty that exists whether or not somebody believes in the spiritual. Uh, but my concern is that ethical claims based on materialist ontological premises are always going to be a little bit fragile because it's hard to ground them in any objective moral framework. Um, and that's why uh, here I've, I've got a dashed arrow leading from the ontological premises to the ethical principles, because I think, as I say, I think it is a bit of a fragile connection. 
Uh, I don't have time to discuss this point in detail, but I'm happy to elaborate on it during the questions if it's of interest. For now, I'll, I'll just note in this connection the, the quote from Abdul Baha, where he says, self love is kneaded into the very clay of man, and it is not possible that without any hope of a substantial reward, he should neglect his own present material good. Uh, this, I think, is at the root of why a materialist outlook on life. Um, will be a shaky basis often for specific ethical consequences. As I say, I'm happy to, to discuss that further in the questions if it's of interest. Okay, so uh, I think it should be clear that between these two positions about animals, uh, Singer's utilitarianism and the Descartian and Kantian view on the other hand, there is something of an intractable argument because they're based on radically different premises. Either the human and the animal are so similar that they should be treated the same, or they're so different that they can be treated differently. And the trouble is that within a solely scientific empirical framework, there's gonna be ample evidence that you could point to to support either position. So the advocates of each position will have no problem reinforcing their pre-existing view based on whatever bias they, they bring to the question. And that's not a knock on, on, on them because everyone, we all do this uh, all the time course in our, in our lives. So let's now turn to the Baha'i writings and see if they might be able to help us resolve the tension between the previous two positions. What we'll see is that the writings acknowledge validity in both a categorical uh, sort of a Kantian perspective, but also in the utilitarian perspective when it comes to animals. And the writings do this by infusing both of these views with a spiritual dimension. So a good place to begin is the Kitab Yaktas, where we find that Baha'u'llah does permit hunting, uh, but he counsels that ye, quote, hunt not to excess. He later also makes this interesting statement. Burden not an animal with more than it can bear. We truly have prohibited such treatment through a most binding interdiction in the book. Be ye the embodiments of justice and fairness amidst all creation. So to my ear, this language sounds very strong, a binding interdiction. Now to a Middle Eastern audience in the 19th century, the most obvious application of this passage would be to literal beasts of burden. However, we know that Baha'u'llah's writings are intended to guide humanity for at least 1000 years. And already in much of the world, the practice of using animals to carry burdens has vanished. So it begs the question, um, are there other kinds of burdens that might be met? Humans of course impose all kinds of burdens on animals. We impose physical burdens, emotional burdens, mental burdens, um, and we inflict them on animals either deliberately or often through negligence. There's a large body of research on the emotional life of a broad range of, in particular, mammals. Uh, we don't have the time to get into the research, but those of us, us with pets can probably attest to the fact that some animals at least are capable, not merely of physical sensation, but of emotion, including pain. So this broader reading of, a, of the nature of the binding interdiction on overburdening an animal finds support in my view in the guardian's description of the Kitabi Akdas and God passes by. Uh, when referencing this passage, he explains that it quote, condemns cruelty to animals. Uh, so uh, in this passage, it seems that the guardian is giving a very, uh, a broad reading to the intended nature of this passage. Okay. Now looking outside of the Kitab Yaktas, we find a remarkable mention of the treatment of animals in that portion of the Kitab -e Khan, often referred to as the tablet of the true seeker. Here, Baha'u'llah is telling us the requirements for a true seeker who is someone who, quote, determineth to take the step of search in the path leading to the knowledge of the ancient of days. I won't read the passage in its entirety um, it touches on the need to avoid backbiting, to seek companionship with the righteous. The bolded portion at the end reads, he should show kindness to animals, how much more unto his fellow man, to him who is endowed with the power of utterance. Now we know that the station of a seeker is not something that we ever graduate from. Indeed, the inclusion in this passage of the prohibition on backbiting and all these other qualities show that these are hallmarks of spiritual life, things that we're called to do during our entire existence on this planet. So on my reading, kindness to animals is no different. It's something that is a lifelong uh, requirement for those seeking to follow Baha'u'llah. Okay, so uh, I think these passages are certainly suggestive 
But what we don't yet have are either specifics as to what the kind of treatment of animals looks like or the reasoning behind the importance of treating animals well. Abdul Baha can help us see the answer to both of these questions. First, let's consider a passage where the master directly addresses the question of kindness to animals. It's a bit lengthy, uh, so it'll be displayed over a few slides. All the bolded parts in any of the quotations are just my own emphasis. Okay, so. Briefly, it is not only their fellow human beings that the beloved of God must treat with mercy and compassion. Rather, must they show forth the utmost loving kindness to every living creature. And indeed, ye do worse to harm an animal for man hath a language, he can lodge a complaint, he can cry out and moan. If injured, he can have recourse to the authorities, and these will protect him from his aggressor. But the hapless beast is mute, able neither to express its hurt nor take its case to the authorities. If a man inflict a thousand ills upon a beast, it can neither ward him off with speech nor hail him into court. For in all physical respects and where the animal spirit is concerned, the self-same feelings are shared by animal and man. Man hath not grasped this truth, however, and he believeth that physical sensations are confined to human beings. Note the, uh, this may be a reference to that Descartesian view again, that animals can't feel. Wherefore is he unjust to the animals and cruel? And yet in truth, what difference is there when it cometh to physical sensations? The feelings are one and the same, whether ye inflict pain on man or on beast. There is no difference here, whatever. Therefore, it is essential that ye show forth the utmost consideration to the animal, and that ye be even kinder to him than to your fellow man. Train your children from their earliest days to be infinitely tender and loving to animals. If an animal be sick, let the children try to heal it. If it be hungry, let them feed it. If thirsty, let them quench its thirst. If weary, let them see that it rests. So, the language here is quite clear and, and quite strong in my view, we must show the utmost loving kindness to every living creature. So kindness beyond which we cannot go, essentially. Uh, the reason given is that animals feel pain in just the same way that we do. So again, this is contrary to that enlightenment view that would, uh, at least for Descartes, deny that animals feel anything. I'd like to just touch on the last part of this quotation. Um, this is often discussed when Baha'is think about the education of children. And it is, I think, a great benefit to a child's development for the child to learn to be kind to animals, but the injunction shouldn't be thought of in purely instrumental terms. The context here makes it clear that the animal deserves to be treated kindly for its own sake, and not simply as a means to train children to be kind. This is quite distinct from Kant, who, as we saw, believed that we should be kind to animals only to avoid learning to be cruel to humans. Clearly, Abdu'l-Bahá does not see the animal as a mere means to human ends. Now, discussions about ends and means can sometimes build false dichotomies. I think what we see here is a holistic or harmonious understanding of ethics and ontology. In the sense that what is ethical is not just good for the one who receives the ethical treatment, but also good for the one who performs the action. Because a good action is one aligned with the spiritual reality of the actor. So that this is a level of harmony between ethics and ontology that I think is not easily attainable without a spiritual framework. Okay, so let's uh, see if we can compare the Baha'i framework as it's emerging so far with the Kantian and utilitarian frameworks already reviewed. So uh, interesting to note that Abdul Baha does adopt something that sounds a little bit like that utilitarian litmus test when arguing that the animal has to be treated kindly because it can feel pain. Meanwhile, Baha'u'llah stresses that the human is owed more kindness than the animal because the human is endowed with the power of utterance. And this seems more aligned with the Kantian legacy, which makes the treatment of animals as ends, or sorry, of humans as ends, a categorical imperative based on their capacity to reason, which is connected to utterance. Here, I'd like to uh, briefly mention an insight uh, that I owe to uh, Nader Saidi, who explains in his book, Gate of the Heart, that in the Bob's writings, we see a harmonization uh, in his ethical writings between utilitarianism and a Kantian style of ethics. According to Saidi, in the Bob's writings, a true utilitarian calculation becomes one that takes into account spiritual as well as material consequences of actions. And so it becomes, in Saidi's words, inseparable from the universal imperatives of the type advanced by Kant. I think we see the same things 
uh, thing happening in the writings of Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha and animals when we take them as a whole. Uh, also, this uh, last point here in the slide, uh, just to note, I'll be returning to the point that um, every created thing has rights uh, later. Uh, that relates to another um, insight from uh, Nader Saidi's work on the Bob. So that'll come a bit later in the presentation. Okay, so uh, I think that the Baha'i standard for the ethical treatment of animals that's emerging so far can help us bridge the gap between the Kantian or traditional Western view and the utilitarian and animal rights positions because the Baha'i view is able to recognize something unique about humans without using this as a justification for denying any duties owed to animals. And as I touched on before, I think the Baha'i perspective also provides a more solid and reliable foundation for kindness towards animals than the utilitarian view does because Baha'i ethical principles are believed by those who follow them to be rooted in the divine law or at least in our understanding at this moment in time of divine law and divine law is conceived of as an objective reality. So these aren't simply rules that we have decided to adopt because they make sense to us or because they suit us for the moment. Um, we believe that they are objective, they stand outside of ourselves and are, are fundamental in the way that the universe operates. Now I'd like to highlight uh, something that you may have noticed. It's an interesting tension between the passage from Baha'u'llah and the Tablet of the True Seeker and the passage we just looked at from Abdul Baha. So the master says that we must be even kinder to the animal than to our fellow humans. Baha'u'llah says that we must show kindness to animals, how much more unto our fellow humans. Not only this, but the justification for each point seems to be in some way the same. Baha'u'llah notes that humans are endowed with utterance. Whereas for Abdul Baha, it's the animal's inability to speak and to plead its case that makes it more deserving of kindness, which contrary to Descartes and Kant, makes our own human uniqueness as reasoning communicative beings, a reason to be particularly caring towards animals, not to deny that we have obligations to them. So what might we make of this apparent inconsistency? There are a number of ways we could try to resolve it. I'm just gonna suggest two. One is the principle that where a statement from Baha'u'llah seems to be at odds with the statement from the master, we should defer to the statement from Abdul Baha, because as the authorized interpreter of his father's words, he knows what Baha'u'llah means and we don't. However, in this case, I don't think we actually need to resort to this hermeneutical principle. Instead, I think what's happening with the tension between these two statements is that it's a creative tension. It's not indicative of any contradiction. So consider that the virtues that we're meant to develop in this life, such as kindness, are dynamic. They're not static. Uh, in other words, we can never reach their maximum. We are ideally never to rest on our current level of kindness and say, that's it, I've reached my capacity for kindness, I've maxed out. We don't know what our capacity is. So when we take these two statements together, I think they can help us put a virtuous cycle into effect as we bring ourselves to account each day. So perhaps I'm somebody who finds it very easy to be kind to animals and I don't get along well with people. Okay, so for me, it's Baha'u'llah's quote that makes a claim on me and asks me to grow. I'm kind to animals, that's wonderful. Now be even more kind to humans. And if I ever manage to achieve this thing that Baha'u'llah is asking me to do, then I can look to Abdul Baha's point and see that my work is not done. Now it's incumbent on me to learn how to be even kinder to animals than my newfound level of kindness to humans, and so on. The cycle can continue for as long as I live, each precept acting in turn as the next rung on the ladder of kindness. And I think also there may be a recognition here uh, out of God's mercy that people are different. Uh, <laughs> some of us find being kind to animals easy, and there's a quote for them if they find it hard to be kind to, to people. And some of us don't really relate to animals. Maybe we didn't grow up with them. We don't much like them, um, and we're more inclined to be kind to humans. So for us, we have a quote from Abdul Baha to guide us. So now I'm gonna turn in the presentation away from these quotations that explicitly speak to the treatment of animals and look at another quotation from Abdul Baha that uh, while it doesn't take the animal as its um, central theme, it is very revealing as to what the animal truly is. And that has a lot of implications for our treatment of it.
So this is from the Tablets of the Divine Plan. Consider ye, no matter how much man gains in wealth, riches, and opulence in this world, he will not become as independent as a cow. For these fattened cows roam freely over the vast tableland. All the prairies and meadows are theirs for grazing, and all the springs and rivers are theirs for drinking. No matter how much they graze, the fields will not be exhausted. It is evident that they have earned these material bounties with the utmost facility. Still more ideal than this is the life of a bird. A bird on the summit of a mountain on the high waving branches has built for itself a nest more beautiful than the palaces of kings. The air is in the utmost purity, the water cool and clear as crystal, panorama charming and enchanting. In such glorious surroundings, he expends his numbered days. All the harvests of the plain are his possessions, having earned all this wealth without the least labor. Hence, no matter how much man may advance in this world, he shall not attain to the station of this bird. Thus it becomes evident that in the matters of this world, however much man may strive and work to the point of death, he will be unable to earn the abundance, the freedom, and the independent life of a small bird. This proves and establishes the fact that man is not created for the life of this ephemeral world. Nay, rather is he created for the acquirement of infinite perfections, for the attainment to the sublimity of the world of humanity, to be drawn nigh unto the divine threshold and to sit on the throne of everlasting sovereignty. Now the context of this quote is important. It's found in the tablets of the divine plan. And in these tablets, Abdul Baha was writing to the North American Baha'i community, urging it to, urging individuals in that community to do amongst other things, the act of pioneering. This meant giving up their lives of material prosperity, uh, North America being a place of relative wealth at the time compared to most of the rest of the world, and to undertake the often difficult, uncomfortable work of the pioneer. Abdul Baha identified that attachment to material comfort is going to be one of the great barriers that these Baha'is will have to overcome if they are going to pioneer. And so in this passage, he explains a simple truth about material comfort. It's not really for us. We can pursue it, we can make it the focus of our lives, but as he says, no matter how hard we work, we will be unable to earn the abundance, the freedom, and the independent life of a small bird. And the implication is that, as he says, man is not created for the life of this ephemeral world. Our true home is the world of the spirit. And this makes sense if we consider that our material bodies die after a time and our souls continue to those worlds of the spirit. But there's a clear corollary principle here. The animal is created for this ephemeral material world. As we know from some passages that uh, we don't have time to explore in depth in this talk, the individual animal does not have an immortal soul that survives death. Each animal, uh, in my understanding, is something like a wave rolling out of the ocean, a specific manifestation of the underlying attribute of God represented by that animal. Once the individual wave recedes, the animating animal spirit of that individual disappears. There's no rational soul that continues outside of this world. Since we have such a rational soul, this world is only a womb for us. It's not our true home. And it's certainly not our paradise, but it is the animal's paradise. It's the only paradise that each individual feeling animal, each embodied expression of an attribute of God will ever know. And that this world is intended to be a true paradise for the animal is reflected in the beautiful scenes that Abdul Baha paints of the pleasant lives of the cows and the birds. Uh, we may also recall the prayer in which he says that uh, the fowls of the air and the beasts of the field receive their meat each day from thee. So now think of how many clean, pure habitats have been to a greater or lesser degree destroyed by humans. And think of how many animals have been removed from their habitats and placed in conditions quite the opposite of those described by Abdul Baha here. And these activities are often done by humans in their pursuit of the things of this world, um, extracting resources to, to build up material civilization. So in the very same activities, we might be depriving ourselves of the spiritual focus that should animate our lives and also depriving the poor animal of the only paradise it can ever know. I'll just add a final uh, note on the same theme. Um, so in his exploration of the Bob's writings in The Gate of the Heart, Nader Saidi highlights the principle of perfection found in the Bob's writings, which is to quote Saidi, 
the duty of all human beings to exert their utmost efforts to realize the potentialities of all things in the world. So this involves on the one hand, making our own handiwork, those things that we create as perfect as possible so that they reflect to the utmost degree, the perfection with which God has made his handiwork. On the other hand, this also includes a specific injunction to preserve the purity of the environment. Uh, Saidi translates a particular passage from the Bayan, um, the Persian Bayan. Nothing is more beloved before God than to keep water in a state of the utmost purity to such an extent that if a believer should become aware that the glass of water he holdeth in his hand hath passed through any impure parts of the earth, he would be grieved. Nader Saidi explains that the implication here is that all the lakes, rivers, and seas through which water may have passed must be kept clean. This is a, a human duty. So not only must we try to perfect the things that we make, but we must also as much as possible avoid contaminating nature, which God has made perfect. The Bob explains that created things are owed this duty to be perfected because once anything appears in its highest degree of perfection, it has attained its paradise. So it's very interesting to think about the implications of this ethical attitude towards all of creation in light of what Abdul Baha says about the ideal life of animals, a description that makes it clear that the natural state is the paradise of the animal. Similarly, the Bob's universal imperative, as discussed by Saidi, is this. Be thou for God and for his creatures, even as God hath been for God himself and for his creatures. So this implies treating all things the way that God treats them, uh, or in Kantian terms, treating them as ends. But of course, this is much more expansive than Kant, who, as Saidi points out, applies his categorical imperative to humans only. This concept of the perfection of created things, I think, has enormous implications for how we treat animals. I'm thinking, for instance, of the environmental impact of large-scale animal agriculture in terms of carbon emissions, deforestation, water usage, um, pollution running off into waterways and resulting dead zones, and perhaps most topically, the transmission of novel viruses to humans, uh, so-called zoonotic viruses. And now these are all important topics to humanity's future as a whole, let alone their importance to the animals. Um, while I don't have time to discuss them today, uh, if, they're, um, if this is of interest, it could be discussed during the questions, of course. Um, I'll also be putting my email up at the end if anyone wants to extend uh, the conversation by email. I'm very happy to, to do that. Okay. So now quickly, let's go, oh, and this the attribution. So let's quickly consider uh, what practical implications this view of, of the writings might have. So just as the interpretations of the writings have all been my own, uh, the implications I draw are also entirely my own. I'm essentially gonna be addressing this practical question by explaining how I've tried to put these principles into effect in my own life. So you're absolutely welcome to completely disagree with the entire presentation. Um, that's fantastic. As long as it's provoked some thought, I think that's, I'm, I'm very happy with that. So uh, in my view, the ethical standard that we're called to adopt towards animals seems fairly clear to treat them with the utmost loving kindness. There are exceptions in the writings uh, for dangerous animals, for instance, that's in a passage that I haven't quoted. Uh, I don't encounter any dangerous animals in urban Toronto, so this hasn't as yet been directly applicable to me. Uh, so given that um, it is not kind to hurt an animal, I don't hurt animals directly. Uh, I also avoid knowingly hurting them indirectly. Uh, so in practical terms, um, I don't eat animal products. Uh, I don't buy new clothing items made from animals, uh, things of this nature. And I've lived this way for about uh, five years now. Interestingly, living this way has, in my experience, had a bit of a simplifying effect on my life. That's been really nice. Um, as uh, someone who resents the amount of superfluous trivial choices that consumer culture con continually thrusts on us, uh, it's kind of nice when you're shopping for food and clothing, if you can just rule out large swathes of the, the products and avoid looking at them entirely. Uh, but simplicity is also, I think, very appealing to me when it comes to spirituality uh, in the following sense. If we think about the prohibition on theft or the prohibition on consuming alcohol, these are very nice and simple. That doesn't mean they're easy. Maybe I'm somebody who really enjoys stealing and I really struggle to break the habit of theft. But at least I know whether I'm obeying the law or not. Um, so by avoiding knowing participation in actions that may have caused pain to animals, 
I similarly have a very easy time bringing myself to account each day, at least in this one area of the Baha'i teachings. Now it has to be said, I, I can't live the standard perfectly. If I use electricity, for instance, uh, as I'm doing right now to do this presentation, uh, part of it is probably coming from fossil fuels uh, and the extraction and the burning of those fossil fuels can hurt ecosystems and alter the climate in a way that has cumulative devastating effects for many ecosystems. Uh, so for me, it's a, it's a standard of doing the best that I can within practical constraints. Now, it's also important to note that the Baha'i view, as I understand it, is not an absolutist one. And one way to understand this, I think, is through the principle of sacrifice. Uh, Baha'is often think of the concept of sacrifice in the way that it's explained by Abdul Baha as giving up that which is lower for that which is higher. And uh, we know that the spiritual advancement of the human soul and of human society are both very high purposes, the highest purposes to which we're called in this life. So if an animal's life is sacrificed to those ends, that's entirely appropriate. If on the other hand, an animal's life or its comfort is taken away for an unworthy purpose, then this isn't appropriate in, in my view, because again, the animal as a feeling creation of God is an end unto itself. It can only be made a means to a higher end, if that makes sense. So an example that I find uh, helpful to think about, uh, in terms of diet, uh, the consensus of nutritional experts, uh, such as the American Dietetic Association, is that animal products are not necessary for human health. Um, so there's a paper from 2009, for instance, that states this very clearly. Abdul Baha, of course, has pointed this out over a century ago, writing in various places that our physiology, including our teeth, are evidence that meat is not an, int an intended part of our diet and also stating that in the future, our food will consist of fruit and grains and not of meat. That said, there may be circumstances where consuming animal products for food uh, may be necessary to serve a higher goal. One consideration may be practical. So I'm in the privileged position of being able to make the choice not to eat animal products because I live in a place where there are abundant plant foods that I can afford. That may not be the case for everyone. Um, and they certainly, no human should starve themselves um, in order to, to not harm an animal. There may also be some specific cases where meat is medically necessary. Abdul Baha touches on this point. So if I learned that I had a medical condition that required me to eat animals to preserve my health, I would do it because the death of the animal would be to the end of my continued life. Uh, not end as a finality, but end as in, ends and means. And I hope that that life would be centered on the continual attempt to advance my own soul and on efforts to advance human civilization, however humbly. On the other hand, uh, the fact that I might enjoy the taste of meat uh, is not a sufficient, or for me was not a sufficient reason uh, when I um, changed my diet um, to justify the death of the animal uh, that provided the meat. So we could think of other examples along uh, these lines. There are many uh, quotations and entire concepts that I didn't have time to address today. Uh, but I'd like to wrap up so we can get to your questions. Um, and I'll just end with a story that I think is very interesting. Uh, and it may help us understand why there's such clear language about the need to be kind to animals. But for the most part, this is not framed in terms of laws in the Baha'i writings. So the story is one told by Abul Qazem, who was Baha'u'llah's gardener. And he told the story to May Maxwell and other Western pilgrims. So it, this is taken from her account of the story. So one day, the gardener tells, a swarm of locusts flew into the garden of Rizvan. Abul Qasim ran to Baha'u'llah and begged him to make the locusts leave before they devoured everything. On May Maxwell's account of Abul Qasim's story, quote, the manifestation smiled and said, the locusts must be fed, let them be. So then after a while, unable to bear it, the gardener returned to Baha'u'llah and begged him again, this time, Baha'u'llah arose and went to the trees covered in insects. Again, from Maxwell's account, he said, Abul Qasem does not want you, God protect you. And lifting up the hem of his robe, he shook it. And immediately all the locusts arose in a body and flew away. So I, I find the story quite interesting. I don't think the lesson that we should take from it is that we should always allow rampaging locusts to consume our crops. Um, at least some of the time, human welfare will probably require that we take action to protect our food source from locusts. So here's what I do take from the story. The first thing that Baha'u'llah tells his gardener is that the locusts should be let alone because they too must eat. But because the gardener insists, 
he, the manifestation of God, agrees to the human's wish and sends the locusts away. And I think that Baha'u'llah's counsels are often like that in this dispensation. He tells us what is best, but he doesn't insist. Because as, he, as a human collective, we're nearly grown up and we've been given a degree of freedom, including the freedom to make mistakes and to learn the true path through those mistakes. So perhaps the counsels that Baha'u'llah gives us about kindness to animals are a bit like this. He's, he will tell us what is best, but he won't insist. And that doesn't mean that the command to be kind to animals is in any way trivial. It's interesting to note that even with matters of the very highest stakes for humanity, we've been left free. Remember that Baha'u'llah counseled the kings and rulers of his time to embrace peace, the most great peace, but they refused and he didn't force them. Now, would it have been better for us if, he, if they had heeded his counsels? We may think so. Uh, so given that the consequences of the ways in which we interact with animals are not just limited to personal ethics, which has been the focus of this talk, but also have environmental and health impacts, I would encourage everyone who sees beauty and truth in the writings of the Baha'i Faith to take some time to investigate and discover what the teachings about animals say so we can each come to our own understanding. So I'll welcome any questions. Um, I have my email address here in case there's, uh, we run out of time and I think it'll also be posted on the screen. These are a couple of questions that have often come up before so I've just put them here in case that's of use. Um, I'll leave them up for just a couple of seconds and then we'll, uh, I'll stop uh, sharing my screen. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so very much I, for illuminating aspects of the Baha'i teachings, which I'd venture to say many of us have never thought about very deeply before, and especially not in relation to the philosophical perspectives that you offered. It gives, and uh, many other aspects of your presentation gave so much more depth to these issues than at least many of us have probably thought of before. Thank you so much. Um, many, some questions coming in here. Um, one is, uh, are you able to comment, this is number two, are you able to comment on the distinction between the terms soul and spirit in relation to the distinction between humans and animals that appear in some explanatory sections of some answer questions? Um, it's an excellent question and I'm hesitant to say much on it because it's been a while since I've reviewed those sections. And uh, I, I honestly think anything I might say would be, uh, less, uh, much less instructive than going back to the original text. Um, my understanding is that when the writings refer to uh, the soul, this is the same, let me actually quickly look to see, I did have a note on this. There may be one useful thing I can say on the subject. You are allowed to pass, by the way, people can go look it up. <laughs> I should probably pass. I, so just, just to note that when the, the term rational soul and human spirit, these are the same thing, as in my understanding, uh, is what Abdul Baha says in some answer questions, um, which means that the animal spirit is something else. It is not connected to the idea of a rational soul. Uh, but I won't go beyond that. <laughs> okay. Uh, there was a similar question about, uh, someone said they have, read that um, animals do not have a quote human soul but not that they don't have a soul in general so i guess this is just asking for clarification of what is meant by soul at least the way you were using the word and the way you have studied in the writing yeah so my understanding uh is that uh so, so the way i was using soul the soul would be um an individual some individual aspect of an entity in this world that continues to the spiritual worlds. And that remains in some way individuated. That isn't simply merged or reabsorbed into some greater principle. Whereas for the animal, I think, I, my understanding is the animal doesn't have soul in that sense, um, in that um, it, it reflects spirit, it reflects animal spirit, but um, there isn't an individual component that goes on to, to the next world. I don't know that that means that we don't see something that is the equivalent of each distinct type of animal spirit in the next world. Maybe we don't, maybe we do. I'm, I'm not sure. My, my sense is we probably do, but it wouldn't that doesn't necessarily mean that each individual animal that has lived in this 
in this uh, material world finds an individual expression in, in the next world. That's my own probably very muddled understanding. So <laughs> again, certainly the new translation of some answer questions is a wonderful source on many of these, mm, these questions definitely. as the questioner mentioned. Yeah. Um, Someone asked that before you gave the locust story, someone asked about insects. <laughs> oh, you also alluded to dangerous animals, but whether you read, know anything particular or read anything about that. I haven't um, seen specific references to uh, insects that come to mind. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, the, the interesting question might be, uh, does science have research to bring to bear in terms of can an insect feel uh, in a meaningful way, I would be inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt until uh, you know until there is a conclusive scientific answer. Certainly, I haven't seen any in the writings to suggest that they don't. Also, um, <laughs> just on a humorous note, often when I tell people that I don't eat animals, a common response is, "Oh, well, maybe we should all eat insects because they have a low ecological footprint and uh, a good source of protein." And my my response is always to think, "Well, I suppose, but." I don't know that I want to retrain myself to enjoy the taste of insects when I can already just eat plants. <laughs> anyway. All righty. Um, here's another one. Do you have comments on cloning of animals? Um, haven't thought about it much. Yeah, I'll pass. <laughs> okay, okay. Um, Someone asks, uh, you may have addressed this partly, but, but what is your view of the fact consumption of meat is not forbidden uh, in mm. the writings, I assume? They yeah, it's, it's a very good point. Kind of address that, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I suppose that the two answers that come to mind are one, uh, a prohibition wouldn't simply wouldn't work. There will be circumstances um, where consumption of meat is re required for human survival. Some of those reasons might be because of structural features about human society that we can change and move past, but there may always be, you know, um, contingencies that arise where meat is required. There's also that medical exemption, or ex it's not an exemption because it's not a, a rule, but that Abdul Baha mentioned sometimes meat can be healthful for certain situations. And then a the larger point I think relates to the story of Abul Khazam that um, there are some things that are so detrimental, I suppose, to human spiritual and societal advancement that they are bright lines in terms of law. They're sort of if we're walking a path, um, there are some very clear signposts, guardrails, if you will, where we just can't do these things or we'll go off the cliff. Um, and then there are other things that take us off the path potentially, but that we're free to figure, we're free to figure that out for ourselves. Um, so. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much. Um, it, this is a, a something someone asks you to please comment. Uh, mm -hmm. It seems to me that if the physical world, quote, belongs to the animals, we have an obligation to care for it as our obligation and kindness to animals. That when we pollute the environment, the water, the air, our own for our own pleasure and advancement, we are stealing the natural world from animals. Please comment. And maybe this is tied to you know, the, the kind of the question behind all this is how does this affect how Baha'is engage in discourse on, you know, conservation and protecting the environment and all of that? Yeah, yeah. But I think, I think that there's definitely something to this idea. Um, it, there's a way to overstate that point, I think, in so far as we know that this world does also belong to us and we're encouraged to enjoy it in a, in a healthy, in a way that's healthy for us in a spiritual sense. But when we take the writings as a whole, I do think that this passage from Abdul Baha and similar ones do suggest that while we can enjoy this world and that's fine and we're entitled to do that, it is more, in some sense, it is more truly the world of the animal. Um, so I, I'm, I think there, there's, there, there is merit to this idea that uh, to the extent that we can shift our mindset from power gives us the right to exploit, to power gives us the duty to preserve and to be a custodian of nature, uh, then I think that will be, I mean, certainly better for the other inhabitants of this planet, but I think also healthier for us. And interestingly, I mean, this dominion-based narrative that came up in the enlightenment, it had its roots in a 
particular version of a, a Christian story about the relationship of the human to the natural world. But there's also strong language in uh, going as far back as Genesis, the book of Genesis, that suggests that the proper relationship between the human and the natural world is one of custodianship and not one of exploitation. Um, mm -hmm. And so in terms of applying that to discourse spaces, um, have you, I'm sure you've thought about, about that as well. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that the, there can be a tendency amongst some of the louder voices in the animal rights movement to preach to the choir a little bit by incorporating into their arguments premises that many people are just not prepared to accept. Um, so going beyond saying the animal suffers, and that is not, it's not just for the animal to suffer for our enjoyment, going beyond that to saying um, there's no difference between an animal suffering and a human suffering because we're all just animals and that's all, that's all, all we are, full stop. Um, that's not an intuitive understanding of creation of, of the way the world works for still most people in the world, I think, who do have some sense of a spiritual reality. Uh, to the human being. Um, so I think that the Baha'i writings give us this unique opportunity to acknowledge both sides, to say, um, to, to, to create a bridge there and to say this point about suffering is absolutely valid. Um, and it's not negated by the fact that the human has a unique spiritual status. So there can hopefully be a way by harmonizing these, these two points to, to bring sides together in the discourse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Martha, could I touch hey, on uh, the, yeah, I do see a question here um, that was asked, how about the logic that if humans eat yeah. animals, animals are elevated to the human spirit, i.e. they will become part of us. And as we eat vegetables, vegetables will be part of us and vegetables are elevated by two levels. Um, and then vegetable soil is elevated to vegetation. So this is, this is an interesting point. Um, there was a letter, I haven't seen the original, I don't know if we have it, but somebody wrote to Abdul Baha expressing surprise that hunting was permitted in the Kitab i -Aqdas. So my sense is that this person was saying, uh, killing animals is cruel, why is this permitted? Abdul Baha's response is quite interesting. He, if I'm recalling the letter correctly, one of the points he makes is that um, on some level, the death of some type of animal life is inevitable um, in our day-to-day -day life. There's no way to avoid uh, certain types of, of killing, frankly. Um, of insects, you know, very small creatures. And the other point he makes is this, that there's no great injustice from the point of view of the matter of which each of these kingdoms is composed because it actually elevates. So if, if mineral matter is absorbed into the vegetable, that's good. It's, it's reached a higher kingdom. The animal eats the vegetable, that's great. That matter has reached a higher kingdom. And then if the human eats the animal, similarly, all this matter has been elevated to its highest possible kingdom in, in, uh, in the material world. He is speaking on my reading of this passage and everyone can of course come to their own conclusions. He is speaking from the point of view of matter. So it is a very interesting philosophical point. As the guardian always reminds us, it's important to take the writings as much as we can because they're huge and we are finite. Uh, try to take them as a whole. Viewed as a whole, I don't see that that principle negates the very clear language about the ethical duties owed to animals, not in terms of the matter they're composed of, but they're them as individual entities, which has been the focus of this presentation. Um, so uh, yeah, so I think, I think that uh, a harmonious reading of those would say, maybe that also goes to the fact of why, why is there no absolute prohibition on eating animals? Because it is not a categorical, uh, you know, sin if we want to use that language because there will be circumstances where it's appropriate and when we're doing it for the right reasons for instance i'm um there's nothing else for me to eat and i need to survive so i can continue my spiritual progress and continue to serve humanity then that animal is in a sense achieving something great it is going towards a very high purpose and that is a good thing um but that will not of course uh, often be the case uh in uh, certain, well, certainly in my circumstances, it's not often the case that I'm left with no alternative but to, to eat animals to, to survive. Great. We might have time for one last question. Um, 
is asking for a comment. It's about compassion for animals and people. As someone who has lived with animals, I found an intuitive connection with them. We both seem able to communicate with each other. I'm very attentive to them and to what I perceive as their feelings of happiness, pain, and fear. Perhaps that isn't the, that isn't the experience for all people. But for me, it has produced increased compassion for them and subsequently for other people. Do you have any comments? Mm, I love that. Um, I think that comment almost stands for itself. I don't, I don't feel the need to add much. I, I'm going to use it, though, to, to raise another point that it, it sparks in my mind. Um, the writings are replete with animal imagery. Um, you know, the nightingale of paradise, the royal falcon on the arm of the almighty. Um, the lions roaring in the thickets. I think it's important for humans to spend some time, and also there's a lot of natural imagery, the ocean, uh, the mountain. It's important for humans to spend time in nature for a myriad of reasons, but one of them I think is to really understand when Baha'u'llah talks about the ocean of his writings, have we been to the, have we looked at an ocean and just spent time sitting by an ocean and trying to internalize the power of an ocean. And if we haven't done that, if we just have sort of an abstract idea that an ocean is a lot of water, do we really, are we able really to grasp what he's trying to communicate? Uh, Abdul Baha makes the point that anything spiritual, anything non-sensible, uh, sensible in the sense of related to sensory uh, experience has to be conveyed to us in sensory terms. It's the only way in our physical embodiment that we have to understand things. And so I think the imagery that is used in the writings is chosen very, very carefully. And I think the same thing goes for spending time with animals. Um, you know, we, we're facing, I think it's, you call it, or scientists call it the sixth great extinction. Uh, we're in the middle of an extinction event on this planet. The previous five have all been caused by natural phenomena, you know, meteorites, um, um, uh, volcanic eruptions. This one's being caused by human activity. Uh, and I think it would, you know, it would be such a shame if in 200 years, a child picks up the tablet of Ahmed for the first time and wonders what a nightingale is because there's no such thing left on the planet. I think that would be, um, mm -hmm. be a great loss. And I think that we've, we've been given these images in the writings because they are the best images for us to understand mm -hmm. a spiritual truth. Uh, yeah. And that's so all that, <laughs> a bit rambling, right. but all that to say, I think associating with animals, spending time with them, spending time in nature, I think these are these are, these are very, very good things. <laughs> Great. Well, with that dire warning in mind, <laughs> and also <laughs> with the invitation to go spend time in nature, the cl closest body of water or forest or our dog, these spiritual experiences we can have even while we're distancing. So thank you again so much, Michael. And thank you for everyone who joined us tonight on behalf of Association for Baha'i Studies. And please enjoy the rest of the conference. Take care.